Hey, Matt, welcome back to the show. It's great to be here. So Matt has been on the show before. If you're a listener, a longtime listener to the Keto Camp Podcast, you're on with Wade, your business partner. Back in episode 207, we're like episode 550 now, and we also had Wade way back in episode 164. So this is your second time on the show, and I'm a big fan of Bioptimizers and Utopia and all the great research and products that you guys have developed. In fact, you're actually a sponsor of, of the show, which is a perfect dynamic here. Um, mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about something that is fundamental, and that is sleep. I always say if you could be doing keto perfectly, exercising perfectly, fasting perfectly, but if your sleep is not optimized, good luck getting the results you want. So Matt, you sent me a slide deck mm -hmm. with incredible research on why sleep is so important. I'd love for you to explain the benefits of quality sleep and why we want to emphasize getting quality sleep starting tonight. First of all, if you have one bad night of sleep, the, the impact is immediate. Let's we'll start with the brain. Your hippocampus, which stores your memories, and it's obviously a big part of your emotions, will get immediately compromised. And I had dinner with a good friend of mine on Sunday, and he told me that his short-term memory was shot. My first question was, how much sleep are you getting? He was getting three to four hours. And he got some CTE, unfortunately, for some military mm -hmm. situations. And where I gave him some sleep breakthroughs, sent me an audio this morning and said he had the best sleep in a long, long time. So. Wow. Yeah, you know, I think sleep is so key for that. Um, if you have one bad night of sleep, you will literally be creating DNA damage. You will be triggering epigenetic changes that are really potentially negative, including the ones that are involved in tumor creation, cancer creation. For anybody who wants to lose body fat, there was a great research done with two groups. One was sleeping five and a half hours. The other group was sleeping eight and a half hours. The five and a half hour group was losing 50% of their weight as lean muscle mass. Mm. And, you know, when I, and I've helped a lot of people lose a lot of body fat, including my best friend lose 191 pounds. And I think the most important thing, or one of the most important things is when you're trying to lose body fat, you want to try to preserve as much lean muscle mass as possible. So to put that in perspective, let's say somebody wants to lose 30 pounds of body fat. If 50% if of the weight loss is lean muscle mass, they would have to lose 50, 60 pounds in order to achieve their goals. They're not going to look good. They're going to have that skinny fat look. And, you know, lean muscle mass is critical for glucose absorption, for health, for strength, and all these really important health benefits. So, you know, even though people don't want to you look like a bodybuilder, preserving lean muscle mass is critical. I was talking to a pro athlete recently. We were talking about sleep, and he told me that, he was using a CGM and had really a one bad night of sleep. The next day, he looked like a pre-diabetic. So the yeah. impact on your ability to process glucose is immediately significant. Also, your ghrelin will go up about 28%, which means your cravings and your ability to control cravings will be severely compromised. So if anybody's in a dietary weight loss phase, a lean muscle mass building phase, it doesn't really matter. Great sleep is absolutely critical. And, you know, one of the scarier stats is about 47% of people have fallen asleep at the wheel mm -hmm. in the last month. And here's one more shocking stat. The difference between the heart attack rates during daylight savings time from the, when people gain an hour versus when they lose is 45%. So the, the impact's immediate. And then when you look at the longevity data, people that sleep you know, six and a half hours or less, or people that sleep over 10 hours will live shorter lives. And of course, I think it's very different mechanisms. And one of the things that I've seen with myself and clients is that as they get healthier, they typically need a little bit less sleep. So they might go from needing eight and a half to eight to even maybe seven and a half or seven. And, you know, what I've really learned over time is that sleep quality is the most important thing. Like I used to sleep eight, nine hours a night, but my sleep quality was absolute garbage. I'd wake up feeling dehydrated, feeling groggy. And, you know, I, I learned the hard way that I needed to optimize my sleep. Yeah. So let's talk about that. When we talk about sleep quality, what are some ways to quantify that? Are we looking at how much deep sleep we're getting, how much REM sleep we're getting versus light versus just laying in bed? Uh, what are, what are the optimal ranges to hit for that? Because it doesn't matter really if somebody's getting nine hours or seven hours, what, what is probably more important is how much of that is deep in REM sleep. Is that, would, would you look at that more importantly? I think so. 
like I, again, I, I feel much better sleeping seven with the numbers I'm hitting now on deep and REM compared to when I was sleeping nine and getting mm -hmm. zero to 15 minutes of deep sleep. So yeah, let's just cover kind of the architecture of sleep. When you fall asleep, if you have melatonin present, you're going to trigger a hormonal cascade that will pull you into deep sleep. And that's where there's a lot of the hormonal magic, the anti-aging, the fat loss magic, the although a lot of the growth hormone production happens during that time. So it's really critical that we naturally trigger melatonin. And we can talk a little bit about melatonin later. Mm -hmm. So I would say about 90 minutes of deep sleep is a really good target. Typically, people get 90 minutes of deep sleep. They're going to feel awesome the next day. They're going to have a great workout. Their bodies are going to feel strong, rejuvenated, and ready for the day. The REM sleep is where there's a lot of emotional processing, memory consolidation, neurotransmitter production. So it's really where the brain rejuvenation is occurring. And again, I'm just generalizing because uh, you know there's a lot of crossover. But in general, you want about 90 minutes of deep and two to three hours of REM. If you're getting those numbers, you will feel really good the next day. So when, and typically you're going to get more deep first half of the night and then REM the second half of the night. So what are some ways we can optimize our environment to kind of assist with those numbers? Yeah. So there's some really key sleep disruptors that if you just eliminate these, you're going to get better sleep. Well, let's start with light and light is free for the most part. And really light starts in the morning. And again, credit to Andrew Huberman for really driving home the importance of getting light in our eyes early in the day because that sets and starts the circadian clock. And what happens is about 14 to 16 hours later, you're going to feel like going to bed. And if you're not managing light properly, your whole circadian clock is going to be disrupted. And I think, you know, it's one of the unintended consequences of modern technology. We've got lighting, we've got phones, we've got TVs. And if people are not managing those things, your sleep's going to be disrupted. So the second component of light is managing darkness. And that really starts about 90 minutes before your target bedtime. So there's a lot of strategies there. One is you can dim all the lights in your house or turn them off. Or you, I've heard people use salt lamps, which is a great strategy. You could have a salt lamp with a dimmer and just kind of create some ambient lighting so you can see where you're going. Second strategy is you can use red light bulbs. That helps as well. So some people will put on some red light bulbs, turn those on. And the third strategy is blue light blocking glasses. So pick one of these and try to manage darkness, again, about 90 minutes before your target bedtime. And why is that so important? Because light will destroy melatonin almost in real time. So if you're just you know hitting your brain with light, 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 your brain doesn't start downshifting and preparing for sleep. I mean, if you if you're in a really dark room and you're managing light, you're naturally going to start yawning and wanting to go to bed. Whereas if you're blasting your eyes with light constantly, you might not feel tired. And that's something that used to be a major problem for me. And the last piece of light is while you're sleeping, you want to be in an absolute pitch black environment where you literally cannot see your hand. So I have two layers of blackout curtains. So there's, and I'm gonna, I live in a city, so a lot of light around me if I don't do that. And for a long time, I used to use sleep masks. And sleep masks are... I'd say maybe better than nothing if you have a lot of light. But the problem is your skin mm -hmm. has photoreceptors and the, the research shows that melatonin production will be disrupted even with the sleep mask if light's hitting your skin. So those are the three elements of light. And again, it's something that most of us can do. And if you do that consistently, you're going to notice much better sleep. The second big one is temperature. So when I was sleeping eight, nine hours and getting zero to 15 minutes of deep sleep, the main disruptor for me was heat. Now I live in Panama. It's a hot climate. So I had AC on. The problem was I was overheating underneath the sheets. So if you have a fast metabolism, if you're, you know, you have a lot of lean muscle mass, if you're a woman in premenopause or menopause and you're getting temperature spikes, I think it's critical to invest in some form of chilling technology that you can use underneath the sheets. I'm a big fan of the chili pad. Some people yeah. use the eight sleep or sleep eight. I haven't used that one, but I know a lot of people love those. And that's, that's been transformational. Like, I mean, when I travel, the biggest disruptor of sleep is definitely heat. Like I'll wake up two or three times cause I'm overheating underneath the sheets. 
So what happens is he's just getting trapped between your body and the mattress. The next one is body flow, sorry, blood flow constriction. So blood flow constriction will cause you to toss and turn while you're sleeping. And this is more important for side sleepers. So let's talk about sleep position. The best mm -hmm. sleep position is on your back yeah. for a couple of reasons. One, you're getting a natural spinal adjustment. And second, you're spreading out the pressure more evenly. You got more surface area on the mattress. But for those of us that are side sleeper like myself, you need to sink into the mattress so that you're getting a more even distribution of the weight from your head down to your toes. And the best form of mattress for that is a memory foam. I'm a huge fan of Essentia. It's a Canadian company. They use a tree sap for producing the, the, the foam cell elements because a lot of the memory foam mattresses will off gas for, for several months. So I'm a big fan of their, their mattresses. Here are some pro tips on selecting your mattress. If you're a heavier person or shorter, then you need a softer mattress. You need to sink in more to evenly distribute the weight. If you're taller and lighter, then you can go with a denser mattress. Also, if you're wider, you need to sink in more. So if you're a guy that works out, you got wider shoulders, or if you're a woman with wider hips and, and bigger legs, then you also need a softer mattress. So those are the parameters. And again, my mattress used to suck and I used to overheat and I wasn't managing light and all of those things destroyed my deep sleep. The next one is a full belly. So one thing that I've seen universally is if people eat a large meal, I would say anytime, like two to three hours before bed, their sleep's going to be disrupted. We've heard for a long time, by the way, you know, we sell the strongest proteolytic enzymes on the market, that when people used mastimes, they would actually get better sleep. And we didn't understand the mechanism. And I think the mechanism is that it's helping process any food that's in their digestive tract and they're sleeping better as a result. So ideally you're not eating like three or four hours before bed. Some people have told me like they even get better sleep if they don't sleep, don't eat for five hours before bed. There's a couple of things you can eat though that will improve your sleep. One is the right amino acids, things like L-theanine and glycine. We'll, we'll get into those. But the other one, which I know we're on a keto podcast here, so hopefully this is not blasphemy, but if you eat about five to 10 grams of sugar, of carbohydrates, that will spike your serotonin a little bit and you'll typically get better sleep. So I've heard a lot of people do a, t a teaspoon of honey. Mm -hmm. I like doing sometimes like half a cup of fruits right before bed. And typically you will boost your serotonin and get better sleep. Why? Because serotonin is a precursor. It's a building block for melatonin. So anything you can do to increase your serotonin will improve your sleep. So that's another big one. Probably one of the most common ones for insomniacs is they cannot slow down their brain waves. And if you look at the research on insomniacs, they have hyperactive beta brainwave activity. I've done about eight weeks of neurofeedback and you know you learn to kind of control your brain waves. So for people that have never done that, there's a couple of things you can do. One is like any form of meditation or mindfulness practice and taking a hot bath, anything you can do that relaxes you before bed will help slow down your brain waves. Couple of molecules you can take that will also help. One is L-theanine; it increases alpha brain waves, and the other one's GABA. So we're big fans of pharma GABA. GABA will also increase alpha brain waves. So you're trying to manage your cortisol, adrenaline, noradrenaline. Obviously, if you're watching some intense TV show or movie, if you're playing video games, if you're in a, you know, on the OCD social media feedback loop. All of those things will tend to increase dopamine, cortisol, adrenaline, noradrenaline, and can disrupt sleep. So trying to manage, again, darkness and stimulation in, in any form before bed is a really good strategy. Those are all really fantastic tips. So, you know, pick and choose each one. But I, I would say start with the morning routine, right? A good night of sleep, as you mentioned, starts the morning of. Take off the sunglasses, go for a nice walk outside, whether it's overcast or not. Let the sun go through your retina and touch your skin. I remember um, a friend of mine, Dr. John Laurence, he uh, has come on my podcast several times and we were having dinner together and he was sharing with me, he has a book called uh, Melatonin Miracle Molecule and all the amazing benefits of melatonin. And he was sharing with me, when you get morning sunlight, it signals to your pineal gland to start storing melatonin for the night up ahead. 
And then when you combine that with looking at the sunset light, uh, mm -hmm. then it signals to your melatonin to start releasing that and get ready, getting ready for bed. And that's a free little tip that we can do there. And for me, same thing. My environment is super cold. Uh, I'm in Miami, of course, but I'll set my thermostat to 63 degrees Fahrenheit. I have a chili pad. I set that to 56 degrees Fahrenheit. I got blackout curtains. I've got the organics bed. So my situation is optimized. I'm getting about two hours of deep, a little over two hours of REM on a consistent basis. And when I don't optimize my sleep environment, like when I'm traveling for whatever reason, man, it takes me off my game like nothing else. I could eat like crap or not exercise, but if I get one bad night of sleep, it's just I'm not on my A game, to, to your point with those studies. So a lot of tips there. And I know you've spent, what, $45,000 like trying to figure this all out? I want to take a quick break from the video you're watching to share something with you. If you've been following me on social media or any of my online platforms, you always see me wearing these glasses. And I always get asked the question, hey, why are you wearing those tinted glasses? Well, these are blue light blocking glasses, and they are very beneficial to protecting brain function and being productive throughout your day. If you're like me, you are surrounded by artificial light every single day from the computer screen, phone screen, artificial lights, and your brain needs to filter out the junk light. We're just not designed to filter that out. And it's a lot to filter out. So the analogy is this. If you had a computer open in a web browser with a hundred tabs open in your web browser, and hey, that's probably you, your computer is going to function slow. It's going to dysfunction and it's just not going to be optimized. But what happens if you take those 100 tabs and close them all out and just maybe leave a couple tabs open? Your computer is going to function better. This is the same thing with your brain. When you use high quality blue light blocking glasses, you filter out the extra junk light so your brain doesn't have to do so. A result, you feel better. You think clearer and you have a more productive day. And that is why I wear these glasses. The glasses that I'm wearing and that I recommend is from Bond Charge. They are a sponsor of this channel and they make some really cool, high quality, well-researched blue light blocking glasses for the daytime, like the ones you see me wearing now, and for the nighttime that are more orange, red tinted. So at night, I switch over to those. They have cool styles like the ones you see here and also clear frames as well. Uh, they have reading glasses. You could get your prescriptions in those glasses and they have a whole range for you. So all you need to do to get your hands on a pair of Bond Charge glasses or any of their wonderful products is head over to bondcharge.com slash ketocamp. Use the coupon code ketocamp at checkout and save 15% off your entire order. We'll drop a link and the coupon code for you down below in the video notes. So go ahead and get yourself charged up with their awesome products. Okay. Let's go back to this video. Yeah. Yeah. Again. And when, so just to rewind back to when I was getting zero to 15 minutes of deep sleep, it also correlated with my testosterone being in the low 200s, highest body fat reading I ever had on a DEXA scan. And just realizing that the number one thing I could invest in was sleep. So I tend to get a little bit intense and obsessive. And I, and I did that with sleep. And I think something to realize, no matter what your goals are with your health and fitness, is that when you start combining things and stacking things, you will compound the results. You will synergize things. And that's what I saw with my sleep, you know, starting with you know, blackout curtains and chili pads and $10,000 custom-made mattress. And I sleep in a Faraday cage. So all of these things improved my sleep 5, 10, 20%, and you're stacking these things. And that's true no matter what your goals are, whether it's fat loss or lean muscle mass, like, you know, try to combine different things and you'll get way better results. I can talk about some of the other things that I did and some of the stuff that did not work. Um, so again, I'm in a penthouse and I see a bunch of different Wi-Fis. So I thought that maybe a Faraday cage and a Faraday cage helps block EMF signals. So I literally sleep in a silver cage. Um, it looks kind of cool. It looks like a mosquito net. And that mm -hmm. did not improve my sleep. And mm -hmm. you know, one thing I've realized about EMF is that proximity is the most important thing. And I guess we're all getting exposed by EMF all the time. But if you're right next to a Wi-Fi router, it's going to hit you exponentially harder than if it's in a different room and you got cement walls. I mean, mm -hmm. where I live, it's all cement. Um, one thing I noticed with the Aura Ring is I tried many times to sleep with it on airplane mode versus not airplane mode. And I definitely noticed that having the Bluetooth signal on seemed to impact my sleep. And it makes sense. 
directly on the skin. One thing that was really an epic fail, and I would say I certainly burned a lot of money uh, in terms of sleep improvement, was PEMF devices. So PEMF devices are technologies that will emit radio waves, magnetic waves, all kinds of different types of waves, and will impact your body. And I tried the Beamer, the Ert Pulse, all kinds of different PMFs, and it was really hit and miss. Sometimes I felt it improved it, and other times it was really disruptive, and I felt completely drained and exhausted the next day. So I don't advise using PMF devices for sleep. I think they're good devices for other things, but not for sleep, including there was some really fascinating technology that came out of DARPA, which is they do a lot of military research. And what they were doing was they were tracking people's frequencies as they slept. And when people hit Delta, which is stage four deep sleep, they would pulse these Delta waves to increase the amplitude of Delta waves. And what they found was people were learning better. So there was a company called Dream, D-R-E-E-M, and also Philips released a, a their own version of it. And the idea was it would track your sleep. And then when you hit stage four, it would start pulsing these Delta waves to try to increase the amplitude of them. And again, it was hit and miss. Like sometimes I felt incredible the next day and then other times I felt drained. So yeah, I don't really advise uh, using those in general. Some other tips, uh, you can elevate the head of your bed a few degrees, like you know, anywhere from four to seven degrees. That really helps. If anybody's getting GERD, like heartburn, it seems to really help with that. And some people believe that can help with the brain cleaning process that's happening as you're sleeping. So that's one. Um, one I'm a big fan of is weighted blankets. Mm. Uh, I'm from Canada. So as a kid in the winter, we used to sleep with five or six blankets on top of us because it was really cold at night. And I used to love that feeling. I think it's that feeling of being cradled. And I think it also helps you minimize tossing and turning. My favorite brand for that is called Sunday Citizen. They have these really good weighted blankets that have quartz crystals in it. And I would recommend using, again, a heavier weight. I'm a big fan of those. So those are all little things that you can do. And I, in, in my opinion, anything you can do to help improve sleep helps. And what, probably other than darkness and a good mattress and cold, the next major bucket is sleep molecules. Mm -hmm. Like giving your body all of the things that it requires to produce melatonin, to relax your nervous system, to slow down your heart rate will improve sleep. And that's where I spent a lot of time and energy and money on. Yeah, and I want to transition there in a minute, but uh, going back to your experiments, I love that you experiment with so many different things. I, I have two, and I also have a PEMF mat from a higher dose. I haven't seen it raise my deep sleep either, but what I have seen it do for me is raise my heart rate variability when I use it consistently. Mm -hmm. If I use it for like an hour, uh, I'll see it bump up the HRV. Did you see that at all or, or just no sleep benefits at all? No. No, I did not. But again, I'm a fan of PMFs. Like I, I tore my Achilles tendon, had reconstructive surgery about 18 months ago. And the Beamer um, was incredible for healing. I literally felt, feel the blood flow rushing in and I was able to heal in half the time. I was taking 60 capsules of mass times a day. And there's some really incredible research wow. on proteolytic enzymes, cutting recovery time in half for all kinds of injuries. And I was doing like a vial of BPC-157 and TB-500. These are our healing peptides. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think PMF devices have their place. I've used them quite a bit and I'm a fan, but again, for sleep, I just haven't found anything that worked for me. What are your thoughts on um, having an alarm clock to wake up? I, I don't use one. I, I actually use a sun simulation lamp that kind of lights up and plays like music quietly and wakes me up slowly. But what about somebody who has an, an alarm because they have to go to work or for whatever reason? Are you, what are some ways to optimize that wake up schedule? I love that question. And I think what you're doing is the best way. I think that, again, we're, we're wired genetically to wake up with light. And of course, if anybody's not using blackout curtains and the sunlight's coming in, and some people like that. Some people, I've talked to a lot of people about sleep and a lot of people actually, you know, obviously they're not living in a city, but they're living maybe in the countryside. It's naturally dark. And they love having the sunlight naturally wake them up. So I think that's a much more pleasant experience. Also, a lot of these sleep chilling technologies have programs which will bump up the temperature as you're mm -hmm. getting closer to wake up time. So I think yeah. raising temperature, 
light are really good ways and better ways than just being jarred awake with a some form of alarm. So I think what you're doing is is the optimal way to do it. Yeah, that's ideal. So if you have to wake up early because you have to get somewhere, uh, there are sun simulation lamps on Amazon. They're all over the place. But I know the Chili Pad, the, the latest version of the Chili Pad, I forget what it's called, has that feature where you could actually adjust the temperature second half to get a little bit warmer, which is actually better for REM sleep. And then it actually mm -hmm. helps you wake up. So there's different ways to optimize that. Uh, I know there's, I have some questions here regarding the, mm -hmm. the three truths about sleep. And we might disagree here. I don't know, but maybe you'll convince me. But you wrote that you should almost never take melatonin. And mm -hmm. I want to know why, because from my research, and I've done a lot of research on it. And again, my friend, Dr. John Lawrence has shared a lot of research with me. I haven't yet, unless you share with me, I haven't yet seen any research that shows taking melatonin shuts down your endogenous production of melatonin, meaning there's no negative feedback loop like testosterone or other hormones, unless there is research out there. So why don't you like melatonin? Well, What's your I found there, there, was, there is some research on rats that actually found that it was uh, lowering their melatonin production. But let's talk about melatonin. So melatonin is really good for falling asleep. It's really good for triggering the hormonal cascade that we want for deep sleep. But in terms of other things, it's not really that great. And there's a lot of issues with melatonin. And we talk about when to use it because I do use it sometimes. And I think it's got its place. First, a lot of people have a genetic variant. And I'm one of them. I've heard Tim Ferriss talk about it. Mm. Andrew Huberman talk about it. Where we will wake up two to three hours before our normal wake up time if we use melatonin. Yeah. Now that can be an incredible hack. So recently I went to New York to, to see Dr. Andrew Huberman and I had to wake up after four and a half hours. If I'm getting five hours or less of sleep that like I know I'm getting because I got to wake up for a flight or something, I will use a pretty, like I'll use like half a milligram uh, of melatonin because it's going to help me wake up and feel better the next day than if I don't. So again, not everybody's got the genetic variant, but those of us that do, uh, it's a What's great the percentage? Control. What is it like? Is it like fifteen percent of the population? Less than that? I don't know. It's a good question. I'm I'm curious about that question as well. I don't know the answer to that. So the second element of melatonin, and this is this is a, I think where almost everybody gets it wrong is the dose. So if you look at melatonin research, your brain will produce about ten to eighty micrograms. And a few years ago. People were starting to talk about using 350 micrograms. I tried that. I was still getting the same response. Now, we have another product coming out called Dream Optimizer. It's a spray. And it's got 18 micrograms per spray. So you can really dial in the exact dose. For me, if I'm using 50 to 60 micrograms of melatonin, it works incredibly well. I don't get that wake up effect later and any of the negative consequences. So I think in general, people's dosages are just way out of whack with what our bodies would naturally or our brains would naturally produce. And we're finding that people are just getting way better results with a much smaller dose, which I think is really the optimal dose, like 40 to a hundred micrograms and you, there's no pills that will get you that. Like the smallest dose you'll typically find in a pill is half a milligram, which is yeah. 500 micrograms. And again, I'll, I'll still get that, that negative wake up effect. So when do you want to use melatonin? Well, one is obviously if you're traveling, I, I went to Europe uh, last summer and obviously it's great to help reset your clock. Typically. Uh, so let's talk about a jet lag protocol and you, you know, cause obviously jet lag sucks. Yeah. So one in, you really want to start on the plane ride. So let's say you're flying 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 hours overseas or to Asia. You want to calculate when you would be sleeping in where you're going and try to fall asleep on the plane at that time. And that's when you really want to use a healthy dose of sleep breakthrough, dream optimizer. You know, I'm a big fan of taking about hundred milligrams of CBD as well on the plane. Yeah. So my, my sleep stack for red eyes. And again, I, I go to LA a lot and I'll take the red eye back is dream optimizer, sleep breakthrough. And if I can get it about hundred milligrams of CBD and I'm knocked out um, and, and I get a great sleep. So two nights is typically enough, but when you wake up, that's when it's even more critical to get the light in the morning 
eat a big breakfast, forget about intermittent fasting, get a big breakfast in, that'll help reset your clock and get a workout in. If you take melatonin night before, expose yourself to light, get a big breakfast and work out, I'd say the odds you're going to feel jet lag or close to zero, like two, two days of that and you're good. The other time I use melatonin is if, again, I'm not going to get enough sleep. And another variation of that is, and we talk about this because it's a really big deal. If you wait, stay awake past your target bedtime, you will get a cortisol response. And that's what people get the second win. And I used to be yeah. addicted to that. I used to love staying up till two, three, four in the <laughs> morning too. and working on things. And I mean, that will destroy your deep sleep because mm -hmm. again, you're getting that cortisol response. So ideally, first strategy is hey, have a target bedtime. And ideally, it's the same time every night. And again, sometimes you got to travel and do things and you're going to be disrupted. But you know, let's say it's midnight. So around, again, 1030, start dimming the lights, cool your bedroom. Like I'll turn on the AC, I'll turn everything on. So it's like a nice, uh, like a chill, a nice box by the time I get in there. And take your sleep molecules about an hour before. So an hour before my bedtime, I'm taking two capsules of magnesium breakthrough and I'm drinking my sleep breakthrough. It'll hit me about 30 minutes later. It makes me want to go to bed, which is a major struggle for me because I just like being awake. And then, you know, maybe 15 minutes later, I'm in bed and I'm passing out and that's it. Because again, I can, if I power through that and you can't, right? If you watch, you're binging a TV show, stimulating yourself with light, you can power through that target bedtime, get that cortisol response. And now your sleep is definitely compromised. That's a good time to use melatonin to help kind of, you know, shut your brain down and, and conk yourself out. So yeah, those are the main ways that I use melatonin. Also, Dream Optimizer is awesome for people that wake up in the middle of the night and want to go back to bed. A couple of sprays will get you another round of sleep. So those are kind of the, the when I would use melatonin in general. Yeah, and I've used uh, your team sent me the Dream Optimizers and I and I used it. I sprayed it underneath my tongue and. Uh... I felt relaxed afterwards. It actually was great. And I've also used sleep breakthrough, which we'll talk about in a second. And, um, it, it really improved my scores and I want to get to that, but let's stay on the topic of melatonin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I, I see research showing that melatonin doesn't really improve sleep. I see some research researching it may improve sleep, but I also see it as an important antioxidant, right? It's very mm -hmm. important for the mitochondria. It's one of the few antioxidants that could actually penet penetrate the mitochondrial membrane. I do really well personally with high doses of melatonin. When I say high doses, like I've done 200 milligrams of a melatonin suppository, uh, mm -hmm. where it's like a slow release and going like flooding through my bloodstream into my cells. I, I wouldn't do that on a long-term basis. I'm just always a big fan of cycling things, but I don't have that genetic variation and I do really well with it. So I think it's important to know who you are, you know, what's going to work for you. And if you have that genetic variation, maybe you do it the way you just shared. And I love the travel hacks as well. That's very important for anybody who travels. So I see the benefits of melatonin, but you're right. It needs to be taken the right way, the right dosage. Yeah. I think that's superhuman dose. And I have talked to Dr. Mito Zen and some other people that are big. Oh, yeah, spoken that. to John about that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's got its place um, again for certain times and certain applications, but you know, let's be clear. It, it would be the equivalent of injecting grams and grams of testosterone. So I think you know short intermittent burst if you need it for specific protocols, it can maybe have its place. But I, I certainly would not advocate doing that on a long term basis. Yeah, definitely not long term. I don't know if I would say it's equivalent to injecting testosterone because there's no negative feedback loop for melatonin. It's 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 different. I know you said there's a study on I think you said rats, but I don't, yeah. there's nothing on humans that show it shuts down endogenous production. I have talked to people that have tried to get off melatonin. Like they got up to like 10 milligrams. They told me it took them about six to eight weeks to kind of normalize. So I don't know. I'd say the jury's out on whether or not there is down regulation. I mean, it is a hormone. So it is, I, I think, you know, and I think also the dose could impact how much down regulation is happening if it's happening. So yeah, again, I have found a research on rats. I have talked to people that have told me that, it took them a while to kind of normalize and regulate. So anyways, yeah, same. And anecdotally, people have told me the same thing. Some people have said, you know, I've been using melatonin for three months. I try to get off and it's, and now I'm having trouble sleeping. And then some people say I've been taking it and I get off of it and I feel just fine. I'm, I'm part of the latter. Like I could take yeah. 
the you know 200 milligrams seven days in a row and not take it and, and go to sleep just fine so i think it's going to depend on the person but to your point it is a hormone um i, I recommend cycling it not overdoing it and being really responsible with it it's just just interesting to kind of discuss this this molecule melatonin but your product sleep breakthrough let's talk about that um i've been using it it's it tastes pretty damn good too so it's easy to you know consume but what was the thought process to creating this process, this product, and what were some of the ingredients that you put in here? Hey, I want to just briefly interrupt the video you're watching to share with you something that changed my mind. You know, I've been in the health space for 14 years, best-selling author of four books, and there was a health supplement that I was recommending and taking that I no longer believe in, and that is fish oil. I know this might come out as a surprise because fish oil has been touted as this anti-inflammatory, but I'm here to tell you. Fish oil is actually doing more harm than good. Check this out. It's estimated that 83% of fish oil is ranted on the shelf before you even consume it. Even the best fish oil in the world will go rancid when it is consumed and mixed with your warm body temperature and stomach acids. A study showed that fish oil resulted in four and a half months of cellular inflammation. Here's the study. It takes 18 weeks to reverse the negative effect of the incorporation of EPA and DHA from fish oil into the cell membrane. This study showed that DHA lowers cardiac mitochondrial activity in your heart. And this study showed in mice that fish oil was linked to cancer. It said, we found that mice developed deadly late stage colon cancer when given high doses of fish oil. More importantly, with their increased inflammation, it took only four weeks for the tumors to develop. So you might be thinking, yeah, but that's high dose fish oil. According to the National Institutes of Health, the average adult requires 7.2 milligrams of fish oil per day, EPA and DHA. The average capsule of a fish oil has a thousand milligrams. It's a super physiological overdose and it creates a lot more problems. So what is the solution? Number one, eat high quality fish one to two times a week. Or number two, what I do and what I recommend to my students is to take a high quality plant-based omega like Pureform. I take this every single week. It gives you the derivatives and the building blocks for your body to make its own EPA and DHA. What I love about this company is that it's organic, cold pressed, it's nitrogen infused, so it is preserved. They are a sponsor of this YouTube channel and they've given you an awesome deal. All you need to do is go to purelifescience.com and use the coupon code BEN4 at checkout to get $4 off your capsules of Pure Firm. I'm gonna drop a link for that with the coupon code in the notes down below. Okay, let's go back to this video. Yes, yeah, so it really started six, seven years ago when I was trying to optimize my sleep. Obviously, I've tried every commercially available sleep molecule, every combination of things. And there's certain things that worked really well. There's certain things that were just consistently effective. We talked about those. And then also I co-formulated this with Mark Effinger, Mr. Newts. He's one of the most brilliant formulators on the planet, in my opinion. And he brought a lot of things to the table that I had not considered. Now, just to talk briefly about how we formulate things, we tend to try to optimize multiple pathways simultaneously. In other words, you know, if we can combine four or five pathways, we'll get better results than just targeting one. Let's start with the main one, which is, you know, we want to give the body the precursors, which is the, the building blocks, the raw materials to produce melatonin. I think in general, it's always better to try to get your body to produce whatever the target molecule is compared to taking exogenous or external forms. I agree. And that's where, you know, it's, it's a great place to start. If that doesn't work, then you can always go to the external exogenous forms. So magnesium is a phenomenal precursor to melatonin. Again, it's a precursor to serotonin, which is a precursor to melatonin. And then one of the things, so we have a lab, we have 20 full-time biologists, scientists, and chemists doing nonstop experiments in our lab, which is at the Inter International Birch University in Sarajevo. And I'd say the most amazing thing we've seen time and time again is how impactful cofactors are. Now, I've heard of cofactors for decades. It's nothing new, but we're seeing like 50 to 300% improvements in these laboratory tests in terms of converting the target molecules into what we're trying to get it to convert to. So wow. again, a, co a cofactor 
transforms the building block, the precursor into another molecule. It basically amplifies the conversion. So P5P, which is in a really powerful supplement in general, it's a bioactive form of vitamin B6, is a great cofactor for magnesium. Again, when we formulate, we focus a lot of time and energy on cofactors. So magnesium and P5P is a great stack just by itself. We use magnesium bisglycinate, which has the best literature on sleep. And you know, I still recommend using magnesium breakthrough. I take two capsules every night. And by the way, we're seeing some incredible synergy in the lab. We're doing red blood cell tests right now to see if we combine magnesiums, do we get more uptake in the red blood cells? And we do. Wow. So we'll be hopefully publishing that uh, later this year. We're still early in that research, but we always knew there was synergy because you feel it. I mean, if you take one magnesium versus multiple, and then when you add cofactors, it, it, it just works differently, works better. So next is minerals. We talked about magnesium, but there's some other really powerful minerals for sleep. Let's talk about calcium. Calcium is, obviously our grandmothers told us to drink a glass of warm milk. It was sound advice. Um, calcium will boost REM and there's a, it will help convert tryptophan, which is an amino acid into melatonin. So calcium is another cofactor. Zinc is another cofactor for melatonin and it helps calm the nervous system. And it's a very classic formulation is ZMA. If you've been around the bodybuilding world, you've heard of the ZMA. Um, so that's a really good stack. And here's the one that I did not know about that surprised me. And that is potassium. So I've been a big fan of potassium for a long time because again, I've been keto now for almost 30 years. It's going to be 30 years in a few months. And one of the best things I ever did to improve my hydration on a ketogenic diet is adding more potassium. Yeah. And most people's sodium to potassium levels are way out of whack. They're you know, basically taking massive amounts of sodium and there's nothing wrong with that, but their potassium levels are not in, in alignment with that. And if you're urinating a lot, if you're going to the bathroom a lot, most likely you definitely have a sodium to potassium imbalance. And, and I, I'll go through that as well. If my sodium to potassium balance is, is off, I'll go to urinate two to 300% more. I'll, I'll hit the bathroom. Same. Right yeah. But when I looked at the potassium research on brain and sleep, we found some really interesting things. So they were doing some of these experiments on mutant flies. And what they found was that sodium excites neurons. It wakes up the brain and potassium quiets down neurons. Hmm. So in the morning, it's a great strategy to mix in some salt with your coffee. I actually, I'm, I like drinking salt coffee, like Me black too. coffee. With salt. Yeah. It's great, right? And then at night, take some potassium. It really helps to quiet down the brain. It helps to slow down your heart rate and... For people that tend to wake up at night and go to the bathroom, it can help minimize that because you'll basically hold on to your water better. So potassium is a really good molecule for sleep. And I, again, I got to give credit to Mr. Nudes for that. Next that's a is fantastic tip right there. Like a lot of people struggle. That's that's part of the reason why people are not getting good sleep because they're waking up, they have to go pee. Then, you know, they're probably turning on the light, raising cortisol, mm -hmm. and then it takes 30 to 60 minutes to wake up. So by taking potassium at night, taking this product at night, it actually could help with the ratios and you don't have to get up and pee and urinate. It could help with that. It's a fantastic tip. Yeah. And you hit a really, another really important point. Like for those of you that tend to wake up at night, and by the way, in my opinion, people that tend to wake up at night, they're just not sleep sleeping deeply enough. Like, and I've noticed that with myself, like if I'm in a good environment in a good sleep environment, I will not wake up. However, if I'm traveling and I'm, I'm dealing with all these sleep disruptors, the odds I wake up go up significantly. So, so in your, so when you're in your environment that you have everything, you know, structured the way that you want, when you're looking at your aura ring, you don't see any whites throughout the night. It's all just blue. Or do you see some whites, but you're not really, you know, cognizant of waking up? I'm not cognizant of waking up. Same thing. I'll see some whites. I'm like, oh, I mean, I don't remember waking up, but mm -hmm. so that's just curious, curiosity. Yeah. There. Yeah. yeah. I tend to not be aware at all of waking up and just, just wake up. Um, the next one is GABA. So GABA is the molecule of chill. It's a really powerful neurotransmitter. And if you look at insomniacs, they're about 30% deficient in GABA. So I think there is a genetic component to 
having insomnia. There's some genetic elements to sleep. And by the way, I have bad genetics for sleep. It showed up when I was looking at my genes with my nutrigenomic expert. Uh, she highlighted that. And I, and I knew that just from my father's struggle with sleep for the majority of his life and magnesium breakthrough and sleep breakthrough have been really positively impactful for him. So for those of us that have bad genes for sleep, it's even more critical that we do all the things we're talking about. But there's a, definitely a genetic element to GABA. So supplementing with GABA can be really powerful. We tested every form of GABA on the market. I've been playing with GABA molecules for a long time. I mean, some people used to use Phenibut, which is illegal now, I believe. And GHB, uh, you, that used to be sold at GNC. That's another illegal molecule. But Pharma GABA is our choice. It's definitely stronger than normal GABA. And what it does, it's t I think it's signaling through your gut to your brain that it's there, it's present because it, it will not cross the blood brain barrier. So it has to be happening through the gut. And by the way, probiotics will produce neurotransmitters. So we invested in a half million dollar HPLC machine that allows <laughs> us to see and measure the neurotransmitter production of probiotics. Wow. And interestingly, the best probiotic we've ever tested for GABA production specifically is P301, which is a probiotic that we sell. And it peaks about eight hours later. So if you take P301 with dinner, you'll get a nice GABA spike while you're sleeping. And huh. again, it will be happening through your gut. So, so yeah. I've been taking P3, P3OM in the morning. So I'm going to change that up and do it at dinner is what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, take it at dinner. And obviously okay. it's proteolytic. And there's only two probiotics we ever tested that have protein digesting capabilities. P3OM is one of them. So it's a really unique probiotic in a lot of ways and very powerful. But yeah, GABA is really powerful. You'll feel it pretty quickly. Like if you ingest GABA, typically 20, 30 minutes later, you'll feel your brain chill. And anything that relaxes your nervous system, anything that slows down your brain waves is going to help you sleep better. The other thing that GABA does, it increases alpha brain waves. So I, we mentioned earlier that hyperactive beta brain waves is really detrimental to sleep. And you see that in, in insomniacs. They tend to have hyperactive beta brain waves, they cannot slow down their brain waves. So from a sleep perspective, your beta, your brain waves go from beta down to alpha, which is kind of calm, but alert heart centeredness down to theta, which is a great state to be in. And everybody hits theta twice a day. Once when they're falling asleep and you're kind of aware it's called hypnagogic. And then once when they wake up in the morning, which is called hypnopompic, and by the way, I love being in a theta brainwave state. It's a great place to, to meditate and to, to do all kinds of fun things. Yeah. But a lot of people just can't downshift. They're basically kind of trapped in this beta brainwave state. So when they take molecules like GABA, it can help boost alpha and help reduce beta brainwave activity. The other molecule that helps with that is L-theanine. So L-theanine has probably been the supplement I've used the most consistently for sleep for the last six, seven years. I like using about 200 milligrams and L-theanine is an amino acid derived from green tea. And that's why a lot of people prefer green tea or yerba mate over coffee. It helps extend the effects of caffeine and it acts like a compressor where you don't get the jitteriness because again, it's relaxing the nervous system. And that's a great strategy in general for anybody that wants to use stimulants. If you use a stimulant in combination with something that relaxes the nervous system, you end up feeling calm, but alert. And, you know, magnesium works well for that. L-theanine works well for that. Adaptogens can work well for that. So I'm a big fan of that strategy of using a stimulant in combination yeah. with a nervous system relaxer. And yeah, L-theanine is, you know, it works every time. It's really a phenomenal supplement in general. And I've been a big, big fan. The last one is glycine. So glycine is probably one of the most powerful amino acids for health in general. I think almost everyone's deficient. Probably 10 to 20 grams of glycine a day is the optimal dose. If you take three grams before bed, there's some really interesting effects. One is that it will help improve sleep quality. It will help reduce sleepiness and fatigue the next day, even if you did not sleep enough. So you know, when we were formulating sleep breakthrough and right away, we did 55 prototypes to get to the final version. Wow. We're already working on version 2.0. Like we just never <laughs> stopped trying to iterate on things, but 
there's a lot of molecules that made you feel groggy in the morning. And we did not want that. We really wanted to feel good and refreshed in the morning. And I think glycine was the best addition in that regard. Also will help lower body temperature. So it actually helps push blood out to your extremities, which is awesome. And it will promote faster sleep onset and improve REM. So yeah, glycine is amazing. It helps with collagen production and all kinds of detoxifying pathways. So yeah, glycine was the last molecule. And flavoring-wise, we just use blue spirulina, some microdoses of some organic berry extract and some stevia, and some silica. We use some bamboo silica extract, which is another mineral that's in there, which is great for hair and, and nails. So literally everything in there is an amino acid, a mineral, or a plant. There's nothing else in there. That's I love the the science and the research and the thought process behind developing this product. And another benefit to glycine, especially people in the keto carnivore space, they're eating a lot of muscle meat, right? So they're getting a lot of methionine. So balancing out that methionine glycine ratio is so important for methylation yep. purposes. So another benefit there. Yep. I remember your team sent me a bottle of a sleep breakthrough before I even heard about it or knew you were developing this. They sent it to me as a surprise back in November. I think it was a few months ago. It didn't have the ingredients. It didn't have. So I'm like, what is this blue powder? It just said sleep breakthrough. <laughs> and I was about to go on a trip to Utah to speak at uh, Dr. Pompa's conference. So I took it with me and then mm -hmm. I took it uh, you know, at the hotel. And then I woke up the next morning. I looked at my scores. I'm like, oh, interesting. I, I saw like a 10% increase in deep and REM. And I was traveling, which is rare because my scores typically drop. Then I took it the following night in Utah. And it also showed the same thing. Mm -hmm. So I was having dinner with a few of the doctors at the conference. And I'm like, you know, Bioptimizer just sent me this, this, uh, this bottle. I don't know what it is. It's blue powder. But man, it's working. <laughs> and then now to kind of hear about the science, it makes a lot of sense. And uh, now let me ask you this. Should we use this in a cyclical fashion? What's the best way to use this product? Yeah, so something I've noticed, again, I've been tracking my sleep since the ZO came out. I think that's like 10 years ago. And something I've seen is that the body tends to, and I'm just generalizing here, but it just seems to be a pattern where your body will either try to emphasize deep sleep or REM sleep. Now, both are happening all the time. But to give you some examples... Let's say you did squats or deadlifts or some form of really strenuous physical exercise. You'll tend to see that your body might get a little more deep and maybe a little bit less REM. And you might not even be aware. And an important thing with REM is there's levels of REM. So the Oura Ring and all of these sleep trackers are really good at seeing the, the total amount of deep in REM, but it's only about 60% accurate at, at truly assessing kind of the quality of the deep or the amount of deep and the amount of REM. So take these with a grain of salt. I'm a big fan of them, but the only way you can get accurate sleep tracking data is if you're wearing an electrode on your brain, because the only way. And unfortunately, there's no more com you know, commercially available devices that I'm aware of. The Dream, D-R-E-E-M, used to be one of them, but they've gone to research only now. So the other thing I noticed was if I'm doing like five, six hours of neurofeedback or really pushing my brain, I tend to get more REM. Like my dreams are more vivid and it makes sense because your yep. brain needs more recovery when you're pushing it that, that hard, that fast. So one of the things I've kind of done to kind of build my own personal sleep system, if you will, is one mag breakthrough every night. That's a given sleep breakthrough. I'm using almost every night. Like I've been using it almost every night now for a year since we've been starting to formulate it. The one thing that I'm cycling in and out is dream optimizer because it will crank the amount and intensity of REM significantly. Yeah. It has California poppy seed, 5-HTP, some tryptophan. And again, I was never able to make tryptophan and 5-HTP work by ingesting it, nor melatonin. But somehow, when you're taking it in these smaller dosages and you're spraying it in the mouth, it works really, really well. And, you know, almost across the board, people are reporting a lot more intense dreaming, intense, vivid, lucid dreams which is great. And I don't think you want that every night. So I'm using Dream Optimizer maybe three nights a week. And again, if I'm traveling, I'm using it. So I don't recommend using Dream Optimizer every night, but Sleep Breakthrough, I've been using it almost every night and it, it's working consistently. I have not noticed any issues. So again, experiment. The other cool thing about Sleep Breakthrough is that you can play around with the dose. Some people are getting better results with like one scoop. 
which is about four grams, and the full dose is two scoops. So play around with the dosage because the dose creates the effect with all supplements and drugs and, and things. Yeah. So try to find the right dose for your brain and body. Yeah. And the, a question that somebody's going to ask is, does it break your fast, right? If somebody's you know done eating at 6 p.m., they take sleep breakthrough at 10 p.m., does that break your fast? Well, let's talk about autophagy because I think one of the things that's a little bit ridiculous is the paranoia around autophagy. You know, autophagy is this continuum, right? Like, you know, you don't go from zero autophagy to a hundred percent autophagy when you hit the 16 hour mark. It's, yeah. it's increasing. It's like a dimmer deeper. switch. And by the way, I am on day three of a fast right now. So nice. How long are you going? I don't know. I, I, I might go five. Let's see. Oh, um, I was planning on three, days. but I'm feeling really good. So, but I'm not paranoid about autophagy. For an example, like if you do cardiovascular activity, your autophagy goes up massively. Yeah. And, you know, if you're taking a few grams of amino acids, your body's going to scorch that very rapidly. And again, it might wiggle you a little bit uh, lower on the autophagy scale than you're back to where you were. And then you keep progressing. And obviously yeah. autophagy is happening while we're sleeping. So... Yeah, I am not paranoid about that. I, I'll even use nootropics while I'm fasting. I'm, I'm drinking nootropics as we speak from Nutopia. I'm drinking Nectar X. Nice. And yeah, I mean, a few grams of amino acids in the grand scheme of autophagy is, is meaningless. That's yeah, especially when you think about, you know, all right, maybe you take sleep breakthrough, it has amino acids, and maybe you, you get a little bit less autophagy at that moment for the hour, whatever it is, maybe. But then if you think about the deeper sleep you're going to get. It's actually going to enhance probably autophagy throughout the sleep. Right. So you're taking like maybe half a step back to get it three steps forward. So if you're concerned about that, there you go. There, you know, made it clear. It's okay to have. And I, and I have it at night, even though I'm in a fasted state, I'm not worried about it too. So if my audience keto campers, for those watching on YouTube or those listening on the podcast, if you want to get this product and give it a shot, it is sleepbreakthrough.com slash keto camp. Remember camp is spelled with the K. And uh, they gave us an awesome coupon code, Matt and the team, Keto Camp One Zero to get ten percent off their bottle of Sleep Breakthrough. And you let us know if you're tracking your sleep with an Aura Ring or a Whoop Band or whatever it is. Like, give us feedback if you if you notice a difference. I think you will. So, sleepbreakthrough.com/slash Keto Camp Keto Camp One Zero at checkout. We're gonna drop that link down below. Anything else you want to share about the products before we move on here? No, all of our products, we have the best guarantee in the business. It's a 365-day unquestionable money-back guarantee. So for any reason, it doesn't work for you. Just hit our customer support team, which will respond to you typically in 20 or 30 minutes, and we'll give you all your money back, no questions asked. Boom. There you go. Last mm -hmm. question for you, Matt, mm -hmm. is another supplement that we didn't talk about today, but it's actually, I believe, the most powerful supplement in the world, and it's vitamin G, gratitude. So my <laughs> question for you is, what are you grateful for today? My daughter. So I have a nine month old daughter. Um, it was a wow. long journey to uh, bring her into our lives. And yeah, it's just been amazing. I, I think from a health perspective, oxytocin is one of the most powerful molecules, maybe the most powerful. Like if you look at all the longevity data on the impact of having friends and having deep relationships and having pets, the one common denominator that's happening with all these things is you're getting more oxytocin. So I think oxytocin yeah. is amazing. And I'll tell you right now, there's no oxytocin machine like a baby hanging out with her. I just feel my nervous system overwhelmed with oxytocin and filled with gratitude. So yeah, that's definitely, I think, number one on the list right now, for sure. That's beautiful. Congratulations. That's uh, that's wonderful. Uh, I, oxytocin is where it's at, for sure. Especially for postmenopausal women, you really want oxytocin. Matt, yeah. where is the best place for the keto campers to go check you out? Yeah. I mean, Bob Optimizers is my dharma. It's my life's mission. You could put $10 billion in my bank account. I'm just accelerating timelines. So yeah, I mean, my life's work is really happening through Bob Optimizers. You can check us out. Um, we're really just getting warmed up. I think we have 35 products in the pipeline. Wow. I have all kinds of amazing things coming out this year from female-focused products to male enhancement uh, products coming out, which we're really excited about. We have an adaptogen formula. By the way, we got a, pro, a keto version of Protein Breakthrough coming out. Uh, really excited oh, about that. So we're cool. working on, on, the, on the flavoring. So that'll be a good, good option for your audience. Um, we have new versions of all of our digestive products. We've rebuilt them from scratch. And 
by the way, if you're if you're on a ketogenic diet and you're not taking Capex, I can absolutely say that you're playing yourself. The impact on your ability to break down fats into essential fatty acids, it's it's off the charts, and we've made it significantly stronger. So that's coming up this summer. Yeah. And all kinds of other fun things. So stay tuned. That's exciting. Yeah, definitely. We talk about KPEX all the time. I share that with my students. So if you're not on KPEX and you're doing keto and you probably are, cause you're listening to this show, get on KPEX, add it to the cart with the sleep breakthrough and any other of the products that uh, you uh, see on the website. Are you doing any conference? I'm sure you are. What are, what are some of the big conferences you're doing this year? Yeah, we're going to be at Expo West. So if you're at Expo West, which is kind of a big supplement and food conference on more on the retail side. We'll be there. Yeah. We'll be at uh, Dave Asprey's event as well. So yeah, those are the big ones we're lined up for. Cool. So if you see Matt and actually, person, and actually speaking at KetoCon as well, I forgot that. Sorry. Oh, I am, I am speaking at KetoCon in April. So hopefully you'll be there and we'll, we'll hang out. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm speaking to him doing a keynote there. So yeah. So if you see Matt at KetoCon or any of these conferences, come up to him and say, dude, I heard you on the Keto Camp podcast. Give him a big yeah. oxytocin hug. I'm sure he'll appreciate that. Matt, and yeah, I, I forgot actually the biggest thing. The biggest okay. thing we've got coming out this year, and I'm going to make a bold statement. I think it's going to be the greatest nutrition book that's ever been written. The first draft was 800 pages. We've been working on this for three years. It's going to be published by Hay House. I think the final version will be under 600 pages. The core message of the book is that every diet works short term and most of them fail long term. And the best strategies to create the best diet for your body, for your genetics, for your psychology. We cover every type of diet from ketogenic to plant based, everything in between. We cover every nutritional, like universal nutritional optimizer. We cover nutrigenomics. We cover gut health. We cover every goal from athletic performance to fat loss to muscle building. It's really the, the culmination of decades of arguments that Wade and I had. I mean, I used to be a keto zealot. Wade was a plant-based zealot, and we argued for years and years and then realized that it all works, and we put together kind of our life's experience as well as our mentors and a ton, ton of research. So, yeah, it's coming out in September, and I think it's going to have a big impact on how people – see nutrition. And again, I'm a huge fan of ketogenic diets, but I think that some people um, need other diets or modifications of ketogenic diets or some, you know, some hybrids and we cover all of it. So that's coming out in September. That's exciting. So September, 2023, stay tuned for that. We'll bring you back to discuss the book. Do you have a title for it yet? We're split testing titles. We have okay. a, a few potential winners. So yeah, we'll probably announce the title soon because we're running out of time. I actually have to up to uh, submit the, the final draft on the copy on Friday. So awesome. yeah, stay tuned. That's awesome. And I completely agree. I, I say that all the time. Diets, all diets work short term, right? It, the, it, the magic is in the variation and also find that customer approach. And that's so cool that you wrote a book all about how to find that unique approach for that unique individual. So that's exciting. I can't wait to read it myself and bring you back on the show. Yeah. Matt, I have vitamin G gratitude for you and Wade and the entire team. Thanks for doing all the research and spending all the money and getting all the scientists and making it easy for us biohackers who could just take these products and thrive. So I am grateful. Uh, I appreciate you. I can't wait to see you at KetoCon and I look forward to more collaborations, my friend. Thanks for having me on.